in that I think we don't talk about enough, which is um, taking the wrong direction and learning from it. I think a lot of times, especially in the social media age, we just try to highlight the positive things or the right steps. Um, so can you give an example of some of the steps looking back that you think might have been the wrong step and what you learned from it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think the biggest thing that, that I had to learn was just like what it meant to build a team. So when when you're trying to grow something, whether that's, you know, you at a corporate level, you starting your own business, you know, your job is to understand that you cannot have all the jobs, right? So I know that I need to hire talented people to help execute on that vision. Now, hiring is very difficult. So I've made a lot of poor hiring decisions and had to learn from those, those decisions and, and understanding how, how making the wrong hire can impact the company culture, how it can impact your goals and you being able to execute on your goals, you know, in whatever time frame you've, you've decided would be the right um, choice for your, your company or your business. So I've made the wrong hires and, and the, the thought process that I've had in those moments is like, okay, how do I protect the culture? Because I think the company culture becomes the most important thing. So it's like, as a, when you're in business, like obviously you have, you have goals, right? You have your numbers, you have your metrics that you want to hit, but ultimately you can't hit those goals without having the right people to, to drive those goals. And so I am always thinking about how to make sure that my people are happy, that my people feel safe, that my people feel secure, that my people feel like they are, they are valued and that their voices matter. And so by creating or by making the wrong hire, that can negatively impact that culture. And then ultimately, it prevents us from, from hitting our, our deadlines. It prevents us from making our goals. It prevents us from having this like really warm and fuzzy culture that we really pride ourselves on happening. Because like I have a startup, y'all. So when you have a startup, like things are moving really fast. There isn't a lot of red tape. There, there aren't a lot of people that you have to kind of get approval for. So that means that we get to move fast and we make decisions fast. And, and ultimately, that becomes our superpower. And so if people aren't feeling safe and secure or like, their, their voices matter, that then disrupts your flow and it, it prevents that small business owner or that small business segment from, from really leaning into their superpower of being small and being agile. No, that's true. Um, I've heard somewhere that if you hire for culture, you can always hit your targets, where if you hit hire for the target, your culture will suffer and ultimately your company will suffer too. So, you know, totally understand that. Um, to your point as a startup, um, there's been a lot of focus on black businesses, startup companies um, in this pandemic situation. So one of the questions that came across um, from Evelyn was, how has COVID impacted your startup business? So I was just wondering if you can share that with the, with the group. Uh, I think COVID has just impacted my life in general. So from a business perspective, like, you know, we are a makeup company. And so people typically reserve makeup for those moments when they're leaving the house. And so now, you know, people aren't leaving the house. So, you know, in the 20s, they came up with economists, economists came up with this concept called the lipstick effect. And the lipstick effect is the premise that no matter if it's an economic downturn, you know, those small pleasantries will still be safe. And those pleasantries included like hair salons or lipstick or, you know, affordable attire because the, the concept was that women would still want to feel like their best selves. They still want to show up. They still want to do those small things. We talk a lot about self-care right now. So it's like people are still looking to have those moments of self-care. But I think what the lipstick effect didn't take into account was the fact that we weren't leaving our houses. So typically people are dressing up for other people, unfortunately. So it's like, if you're not leaving your house, you're not gonna put on makeup. You're not gonna put on your fancy attire to just sit on your couch. So we had to rethink about our, our value proposition that we were offering to our customers and understand that, you know, the way they approached makeup or their relationship with makeup is completely different right now than it was seven months ago, pre-COVID. So we had to close down our store in downtown Detroit. 
Um, and then we really had to just think about new and, and exciting ways to build relationship and build connection with our customer base. Because ultimately, you know, that's, that's what any business is. No matter if you're, you're B2C or B2B, your job is to build an authentic and a lasting connection with your customer. And so we had to start listening to them. And that's what I advise everyone. Listen to your customers. Do customer listening. Do social listening. Social media is the fastest and easiest and most affordable way to actually get in front of your customer and understand exactly what they feel about your product or service. No, that's huge. Um, I mean, I found myself dressing up to go get the mail and go to the grocery store because I was like, I'm, I got to stay cute somewhere. But um, so you hit a point um, about um, listening to customer insight. But also, I think what we saw on social media was there was a big push on supporting black businesses. Um, I would say more in the pandemic environment than I've personally seen ever. So um, you have some very interesting views that I think will be good to share with everyone on supporting black businesses pre and post COVID. Um, so can you share your thoughts on that with us? Yeah, and it's funny that you ask because even yesterday I had to have a conversation, another conversation with my team because at the top of COVID, March was like our worst month in probably a year. Like we went from like, having stellar growth in February to March being like, can we pay our bills? Wait a minute. And then, so we had to like, again, we had to rethink about what our, our value proposition was. And then with the, the consistent injustice that's happening in our country, you know, we've seen, I, I don't know what it was about this visceral um, murder of, of George Floyd, that, that took place that made everyone wake up because like this has been happening for 400 years in this country, but it was something about the George Floyd incident that really gave people like another understanding of, of how we should be operating um, in this country and how we as black people can take back our power. And then ultimately we saw a lot of non-black people like allies as we would call them you know, step in and say, you know what, how do we empower the black community? And I'm going to do that with our dollars. So we went from March being our worst month in a year to June being our best month in lip bar history with a lot of those customers being non-black people, if I'm going to be completely honest. And my immediate re reaction was like, this is great, but I don't want this to be charity dollars because I'm building a business. I'm building a business that needs to sustain over time. And I don't want this, this false narrative and this false growth um, to happen in June if I can't replicate that success. And so what I am really adamant about is just making sure that we're not treating shopping black and black businesses as a trend because it's dangerous to those black owned businesses. It's dangerous to, to our economy and our, our welfare. Like, if I would have said, oh my God, our sales are through the roof, maybe I need to hire more people. But then in August, my sales don't reflect what they look like in, in June, then maybe now I have to lay that person off. Maybe now the risk that I was willing to take because I've had this false sense of growth, you know, maybe, maybe that's not a good risk. So I would just implore everyone to make sure that we are we are keeping that same energy as it relates to empowering the black community through through our dollars. And, and I say that for for black, white, brown, purple people, because I think that's the only thing that's going to change the way um, like change the, the relationship in this country. Because like there's a race thing happening, but also I think there's a class thing that no one is discussing. And we really have to figure out how, how do we as the talented 10th uplift our brothers and sisters who are a part of that 90%. So, you know, this is something that's been happening for, for hundreds of years. And I think that now more than ever, I am super excited because I think that, that we get it and we're ready. No, that's awesome. I totally agree. I feel like that's a hashtag in itself, like supporting black businesses shouldn't be a trend, right? So um thanks for sharing that and i think to your point of there's a class a secret class thing going on i 
adamant about that, but I think that's a whole different podcast that we might want to talk about uh, <laughs> on a different day. But uh, Candace had a question, which I think is great, um, which is talking about courage and sometimes doing things um, afraid. So how did you have the courage to leave your full-time job and venture out into starting your own business? Um, well, I thought about it from the perspective of I would rather take the risk than have the regret. And so I also understood my tolerance for risk. So I don't think there is a certain time. Like, I don't think there's a magic formula that says you should quit your job at this point or when you have this much money. You really have to just understand, like, what is your risk tolerance and what, what are you able to withstand? When I quit my job working on Wall Street to focus on the lip bar, it wasn't because the lip bar was making me so much money. Like it wasn't even replacing my, my salary, if I'm going to be completely honest and transparent with you all. But I knew that I had to invest 100% in my business for my business to give me 100%. What I also knew is that I didn't have any children. I didn't have any a husband. All I had was student loans. And I was like, Sally May can wait. So that, that was the risk that I was willing to take. But, you know, I think that you really have to assess your situation and understand, like, how much money do you need to actually survive over time? And so when I did quit my job, I, I thought that I saved up a year's worth of savings. It only lasted six months. I ended up having to be super scrappy about it. Me and my roommate ended up airbnb her room. She moved into my room. So it's like, that's a crazy risk. And it, it could have been dangerous, but like that was my risk and that was my story. So I don't, I want people to be incredibly careful about taking on other people's stories and thinking that it's easily adaptable to your life because you have to know that that is, it's your journey and there's no perfect journey. It, it's just yours and you have to make that journey um, work for you. So there isn't, there isn't a certain time and and to be honest, I wasn't that courageous. I was scared as heck. I was super scared, but I was just like, you can do it. And at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, you can always go back to that job. And, and that was my mindset at that time. You hit a point. Um, I think T.D. Jake says that a lot of people see successful people and they want what they have, but they aren't willing to go through the low moments or the long nights um, to get what they've acquired. Right. And so what other things outside of because that I mean, that's a very key point of like renting out a room, like rooming with your roommate in the same room. Like that's some that's some stuff that I didn't even know. So that's cool. Right. But, right? <laughs> <laughs> what are other pointers or like actions or activities that you had to do that led to your success, that led to your expansion that sometimes people don't see right they see the glamour they see the pictures they see the awards and the recognitions but what happened kind of what are some other examples of some of the behind the scenes that we don't know well I mean so many things everything from us trying to raise money so we were launching into our, our first big retailer and the idea of fundraising has become super attractive it's sexy nowadays people are like I want to raise money I want to be a startup founder who raises x amount of dollars and you know I want to be a unicorn um, but if you don't come from a background where you understand what fundraising even looks like, it's literally like a foreign language. There are all these acronyms. They're, they're just all these things that you don't know. So here I am about to expand into this retailer and I have no money to do that expansion. So I started looking to fundraise. I started pitching venture capitalists. I think I, I, think I pitched over 100 investors and every single one of them said no every single one of them said no. And they would tell me, oh, Melissa, you're such an impressive founder. Oh, you're so articulate. Oh, you used to work on Wall Street? Wait, you started making this in your kitchen? Wow, that's impressive, but no, I'm not gonna give you my money. You know, and so I had to eat that over and over again. And I had to question, you know, if it was me, if it was the business, if I was doing the right thing, like, did they see something that I didn't see? Because again, I didn't come from a retail background. I was a numbers girl. I was a Wall Street girl. So, you know, I didn't know anything about the beauty industry. I didn't know anything about selling uh, consumer products, but I just, I felt something in my spirit that said I can solve the problem of women not believing in themselves. So I was going off of a gut feeling, a hunch that said, no, Melissa, this is what you have to do. This is your purpose for right now in your life. And even though I got that one, all 100 no's, I eventually got a yes. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, when we first launched and, and that retail partner 
we didn't have any outside money. We didn't have a marketing budget. I think I was able to get kind of like a line of credit with the local organization in Detroit. And I'm just like, we're just going to figure it out. We're going to make it work. I wasn't even paying myself. So that's a whole nother thing. Like I didn't pay myself from the lip bar, like a salary for six years. I took like a, a very small monthly stipend. So there have been just so many, so many sacrifices. Um, but I think that the name of the game is just like that resilience. And it's that if you continue to show up for yourself and if you continue to show up for your purpose, there is no way that something won't shift because along the way you are learning. You're learning again, again, like I started the conversation. My job is to make sure that I'm getting a little bit better every single day. So it took me six years to get to the point in which I could pay myself. It took me six years until I could actually pay other people and like really start staffing up to scale this business. And so no one, no one talks about that part of the story, like the, the sacrifice on a personal level that it takes. But, but I will say that it's the most fulfilling thing I've ever done. It's also the most difficult thing I've ever done. People are like, oh, you must have learned all of this, like how to learn, how to run the lip bar while you were working on Wall Street. I'm like, no, actually, I think I learned it at FAMU. I think I learned it pledging Delta. <laughs> I think I learned it coming from Detroit. I just learned that, you know, no doesn't mean, it doesn't mean stop. It means maybe you need to learn a little bit more. Right. So speaking of that, when people gave you the no, um, did they provide any feedback or any coaching to you as it um, related to why they gave that no? Uh, there were a few questions about that in the chat. Um, sometimes they did, but you know, I when I first started out, when I first started hearing no, it made me very uncomfortable. I don't think I had the courage to ask what's wrong with me because that's how I thought about it. What's wrong with me? Why am I not the chosen one? Um, so I, at first I didn't ask, but over time I realized that there was something for me to learn in every one of those no's. Um, and so people don't always want to offer up that advice because ultimately people don't like to have uncomfortable conversations. But I started asking, you know, if a retailer tells me no right now, like, oh no, we don't want the lip bar on our shelves. I'm going to say, why? You know, is it, is it that you think that we are, we're not a good brand fit? Do you think that we can't ha bring in the customer? Do you think that, you know, I'm going to ask questions. So now people offer feedback because I kind of force it out of them. And I think that that's just, it's the best way to grow to make sure that you know that what you're putting out into the world is exactly what people are receiving. No, that's good. That's good. Um, to your point you made earlier about not really having the funding and getting creative um, with it, there was a question that came through, I think from Alicia, that said, do you have any marketing tips outside of social media that you can share with startups that have limited financing? Yeah, I think you have to build your own lane. Like you have to have a wow factor. So I'm gonna give you an example of something that I did. When we, we knew that makeup is a very intimate purchase. It goes on your face. You want to know that it looks good on you. We also knew that most makeup sales were still happening at the beauty counter. So people wanted to go into stores. They wanted to try on the product so that they can have that confidence. So we knew that we weren't ready to go into a store, into a beauty counter because it costs money. Like me having a relationship with a retailer, while it sounds super glamorous, it's also very expensive for us to do that. And so I knew that we weren't ready, but also I knew that people wanted to try on the product. So I'm like, okay, you know, I have this gap that I need to figure out how to fill. So instead of focusing on getting into that retail store because I didn't have capital to do so and I didn't really have a lot of marketing dollars I built a truck so I think the lip bar truck costed fifteen thousand dollars and like we we reinvested every single penny from the business to make sure that we got that truck and then we took it on tour so not only were we able to start spreading the word about the product but also we were doing something that was really cool that gave people something to talk about so you want to make sure you're giving people something to talk about. You want to make sure that you're building community and making sure that you know your customer so well that when you do something, you know that it's going to pique their interest. So if you haven't done so 
in your marketing plan, I would absolutely encourage that you literally, you can even do it on Pinterest, build a board that, that literally describes every single thing about your customer, what she wears, what she shops, where she grocery shops, what she watches on TV, who your competitors are. Like, don't think only within your industry or in your lane. Think about the ways that, that you can impact her life outside of the product. Think about the ways in which you can connect with her because you know her so well because you are her. So that's, that's going to always be my advice. Know your customer and then do something out of the box that you know she's going to appreciate so that she can start being your word of mouth. No, that's good. That's good. Um, there's a lot of people pretty much doing the high fives and the amen corners in the chat box to what you've been saying, but we'll show you that with you <laughs> offline. But um, you've highlighted the fact that you've pretty much put your business and your focus and your vision over yourself on multiple occasions, right? Um, so in the middle of COVID, in the middle of building this brand over the last almost 10 years or so, how do you balance personal life and professional life? And specifically in the midst of COVID, how are you taking care of your mental wellness? Yeah, I'm so happy that you asked that question because to be completely honest, up until last year, I wasn't. I wasn't taking care of myself. I was not putting myself first. Like I remember having to go to a lip bar event and literally 15 minutes before the event was starting, I was like trying to like take off like my raggedy nail polish. I was trying to like not show up looking so crazy because I hadn't even thought about how I have to show up to that event. And so about a year ago, I was just, I was completely burnt out. I was like, you're just doing so much and you're, you're running yourself into the ground. And so I was like, something has to shift because like I said, if I'm not 100%, I can't give my business 100% and vice versa. My business can't give me 100% if, if I'm not giving it 100%. So it's a two way street. We both have to be at our best in order to like meet those goals or to, to really scale. So I realized this about a year ago and I was just like, Melissa, everything is going to end. If you if you think that the weight of the world is on your shoulders now, like think about what it's going to look like, you know, if you're sick in the hospital bed because from sleep deprivation. Like think about what it looks like if you, you know, if you are diagnosed with some sickness because you're not eating properly. So I started really having honest conversations with myself and I was like, it's okay to take a break, Melissa. It's it's okay to to say no. It's okay to prioritize yourself first. And I've been doing that for about a year and I'm super proud of it. Um, I lean on journaling a lot. I connect with nature, like I'm a nature lover. So whenever I'm feeling, you know, that stress swell up in my chest, you know, I go for a walk. I go and look at trees. I stare at the water. Um, I might go hiking. So I try to connect with nature because when I am in the midst of nature, I am reminded of how powerful the world is. I'm, power, I'm reminded of how powerful God is. I'm reminded that, that God has created all of these different organisms to operate in their truth. And they're not, they're not questioning it. And so then it reminded me to stop questioning myself and, and allow myself to slow down. So yeah, I journal, I work out. And COVID, I've like, I've been pretty consistent. I, w I would say I work out probably three times a week. I've cooked more than I've ever cooked. I'm so <gasps> sick of cooking. Uh, don't want it no more. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've been focusing on me. And I think that the lip bar has grown because of it. No, that's good. That's good. Um, uh, one or two last questions, and I'm sorry, I can't get the names because they were going through so fast. But one question that came through was, what transferable skills um, did you see or have you applied from corporate America into your entrepreneurial track? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I would say networking is probably the biggest one. I'm not a good networker. I, I don't like it. It makes me very uncomfortable. But I remember working in corporate, it was really important to understand, like, you first wanted to understand your trajectory, like, where did you want to go? And so from there, you would have to talk to other people on other desks. I worked in Wall Street. So I would have to talk to a different trading desk or, you know, the bond group, because I, I found that to be interesting, or I wanted to talk to the options group. So networking became really important. 
And I didn't really know how to, because I would just approach them very awkwardly, like basically, hey, I wanna learn about everything that you're doing. And I think that's probably the most transferable skill, simply because it taught me that I had value. Because when, what made me really antsy about networking was this concept of I need something from them, not I can also provide something to them. And so, um, you know, going through that process of Wall Street and understanding that, that you can't grow alone, that you need to reach out to mentors, that you need to reach out to advisors has certainly helped because, again, I started this company without any prior knowledge of the industry. And so I've had to do my due diligence to make sure that I was learning from people who knew a little bit more than me so that I could go a little bit further, a little bit faster. So networking is probably the biggest thing. And then those Excel spreadsheets, Woo! those Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's fair. Um, we're going to leave the Excel to the side because that's a whole different course. Um, Cause if you don't use it daily, you kind of forget it sometimes. Um, so I want to do a wrap up and try to kind of, include one question that came in as well. So sorry for kind of like a two in one. Um, but in closing, what pointers, advice, words of wisdoms or jewels do you want to leave with the group? Um, and if you could touch on how you had to balance authenticity, because you come off, you just exude authenticity, right? Um, we got that in the comments as well. But sometimes to balance authenticity with collaboration isn't necessarily the same thing, right? There creates some tension there. So as you give pointers, could you also talk about the balance between authenticity and collaboration? Oh yeah, it's, I'm happy that you actually merged them because it's the exact same thing for me. Um, so my biggest pointer is that there's room for all of us. When I started this company, people told me I was crazy because the industry was so saturated, right? But at the end of the day, I don't believe in saturation. I believe in segmentation. I believe in carving out your own lane. I believe in the power of, of my journey. And so with that being said, I know that if I have an idea if I have a concept, if I have, you know, some advice to give, I know that there is room for that idea. I know that there is room for that path. I know that there is room for my growth because I live in a limitless world. I live in a world full of abundance. And so that's exactly how I approach the authenticity because I understand exactly who I am and I'm proud of it. And I show up in that, in that light every single day. Like I don't, People ask me actually, like, how, how should I be more authentic? And I'm like, it, that's not even, even a question. It's just like, be you. Do whatever is in your heart. Like I told Crystal, I was like, you don't have to send me any questions because I don't, I'm not going to read them because ultimately I'm just going to give you all whatever is right here. I'm not going to rehearse anything. I want you all to know exactly what is in my heart and what, what my spirit has led me to speak about. And so I think that that is how, how you understand that there's room for you because when you are living in your truth and living in your, in your authenticity, then then you don't have a, a mindset of lack. You have a mindset of abundance because you know who you are, where you came from, and where you're going. Thank you so much, Melissa. You have been awesome. Um, the chat room is kind of going off with all of the gems. Um, we might need to do, pass a collection plate to give you an offering or something, but <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Um, we unfortunately have to move on, so I'm going to pass it on to Chardonnay, but on behalf of EOC and everyone on the um, call today, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate everything you shared. Thank you so much to ELC. Crystal, your questions were amazing. Thank you to AIG. I really appreciate this experience. I loved it. Thank you.